NMAP, also known as Network Mapper, was 20 years old in 2017. Yet today, it is just as current and an effective tool as it was in 2017 when it was 20 years old. The reason why is because of the dedicated engineers and developers who have maintained this utility, kept it up to date and current. So today, IT pros still turn to NMAP to assess their computers, their firewalls, their services, the protocols they run on their network to understand the cybersecurity posture of their network. A few years ago, many of the developers that work with NMAP decided to write, using Python, a GUI interface to NMAP. It's called ZenMap. It's awesome. Whether you're a newbie, in NMAP or you're an advanced user. I think you'll find ZenMap just an awesome way of using the NMAP utility. It gives you a very visual view of using NMAP and seeing the results of it in a very unique way. It has a feature called Profiles. Profiles simply allow you to combine command line parameters and scripts when executing NMAPs. This is a great feature of ZenMap. So what is NMAP? Well, NMAP is a powerful network utility leveraging the use of the components of Ethernet, IP, TCP, UDP, any network protocol structure by using those architectural components such as fields and field types. And we'll, by leveraging this architectural structure, and I've got the ICMP header here on the slide, you can look at the type codes in the various fields that are in the ICMP header. By leveraging this information, which is very complex, the user for NMAP can get host information, operating system fingerprinting information. Is there any exploits running on this PC or server or service or firewall? Information about applications, host mapping, DNS information, firewall, by leveraging the architectural components of the network stack. Network engineers over the years have found that if they look at, say, the IP architecture, all the various fields that allow us to use IP. And if you look at fields like version, internet header link, type of service, total length field, identification field, the flags, fragment offset, by learning to manipulate all of this complex structure that allows us to communicate IP information, they have learned that host services applications respond a certain way as they manipulate the data in these fields when they send it to devices. By looking and analyzing that return data, they can start pulling incredible amounts of information about those hosts using this technique. I'm using the IP header just as an example. You can do this with Ethernet. You can do this with 802.11. It doesn't matter. All of these network structures have very predefined architectural components, such as a 4-bit version field. All of these fields can be manipulated. And once this data is sent to a host, the returned information that comes back is then carefully analyzed. This has taken years and years and years of analysis, and now they can look at that analyzed information and determine Things like the operating system, what protocols are being run, what ports are open, what service is running on that particular port. All kinds of information, even the version of that protocol that's running on that PC or that server or that firewall. They can build identifying information from that returned traffic back to NMAP and determine all kinds of information that is very helpful to the IT pro. Now, MMAP does not want to be detected while it's doing all of this 
identification. So it's very clever in the way that it communicates to a destination device, and this doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a Synology labs, whether it's a storage unit, a firewall, a server, computer on the network, an iPad, an iPhone, it doesn't matter. It's going to send out information to that host that is incredibly subtle and is very hard to detect the fact that Nmap is even doing this to the device. Look at the bottom right side of my graphic. You will see a set of data that has come back from a host. This is known as a fingerprint. And when you look at that, you really can't discern exactly what that is telling you. But Nmap uses a complex series of analysis taking this kind of data and can help determine by using what's known as a fingerprint. They can analyze this data that is returned back from that host and determine the type of operating system, the version. So this under the hood computation is very complex Nmap is not hard to use, but it is a challenging tool to learn how to interpret the data that you're seeing. A couple cautions when you're using Nmap. Be sure to determine your company's policy on scanning the network prior to using Nmap on any company network. That includes your company's ISP. Many ISPs have stated policies of revoking your internet service if they detect abusive internet scanning. Your home is your own and it's safe to scan your own home. To begin using Nmap, you want to go to their website, nmap.org. They have very extensive documentation, whether it's in store, getting the NPCAP driver set up on your network card. All of that is thoroughly covered in their reference guide documentation. If you're going to install it on Windows, remember you need both the Nmap utility and the NPCAP driver for your network stack. They have installation guides for both Linux, Mac OS, or FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, Sun Solaris, and a variety of Unix flavors. Nmap's documentation is extensive. And the first thing you become aware of as you dive into this, and I'm just scrolling through just one section of it called Host Discovery Techniques. You can see all the parameters that you can use to do certain functionalities with Nmap. And they show you results, and they show you another argument and parameter that you can use. And it quickly, I can go through pages and pages of this. You can become overwhelmed with all of what you can do with Nmap. There is some really good help to get through what you want to do without becoming overwhelmed with all of these parameters. So to help people get started with Nmap, they have it broken down into categories. I'm gonna show you what that is. Libraries, which are the core functionality of Nmap's operation, and this rich set of scripts using the Nmap scripting engine that it's going to allow you to do incredible functions and features with Nmap that are relatively easy to use. Back to the website, look at the scripts. You can just scroll through these scripts. All of these scripts are combinations of parameters and feature functionality of Nmap that do a specific thing. So if I need to focus in on broadcasting and discovery, I could use a variety of scripts here you can see with a title of broadcast. Here's a section on DNS. If I'm looking at using Nmap to leverage DNS information, I have a list of scripts that I can use against a host or against a network so that I can pull DNS information out. The richest library of scripts is the HTTP, which makes perfect sense with all the web servers on the internet. So there's just this unbelievable list of HTTP scripts that you can use with Nmap to perform tasks that you want to do. Back to the library, we, there's a long list of libraries also, and this makes up the core functionality of Nmap. And finally, to make it much easier, they have what's categories. If I want to take all the features that deal with authentication, I can just use the AUTH category and use Nmap with that. And it takes scripts, libraries, parameters, and all of the features that go after authentication right with one simple category. So for example, if I want to tack a host and look, are there any exploits that are built into Nmap and I want to scan 
that host with those exploit scripts, parameters, et cetera, et cetera, I simply can use the exploit category. Before we go back and demonstrate some more of Nmap as we scan against devices, let's first review the phases of the scan. Nmap's documentation describes when you run Nmap, it runs in phases. So let's take a look at those and it will make more sense as we begin to execute and demo Nmap more. Now the first phase of Nmap is called script pre-screening. This is where Nmap scripting engine uses a collection of special purpose scripts to gain more information about remote systems. They use scripts like DHCP-discovery, broadcast DNS service discovery. You can't run Nmap without this phase. The second phase is called target enumeration, and it's going to research the DNS name or the IP address or the CIDR notation you've added. You can't skip this phase since it's essential for further scanning. Now you can use the dash SL or dash N option, and it will find the target but perform no further scanning. Third phase is host scanning or ping scanning. This phase is run by default, but can be skipped if you use the dash PN option. Now I'm giving you very brief descriptions of each of these phases. In the documentation, they give you a lot more information, so bear that in mind. Next, we're gonna to go to reverse DNS resolution phase. It's going to look up the reverse DNS name of all your targets. It could be a host name, a domain name, or an IP address, or a subnet. This step can be skipped with the dash N option. The next phase is port scanning. This is Nmap's core operation. It has no problem scanning 65,000 plus UDP and TCP ports. They have a feature where you can scan the top 1,000 port numbers rather than all 65,000, you can enable that option. The next phase is version detection. By sending a variety of probes to any open ports and matching that return traffic against a database of over 6,500 known service signatures, they can possibly detect the service and the version. The next phase is OS detection. If you request with the dash O option, it will probe the target against a database of more than a thousand known operating system responses. Remember, it's analyzing the return traffic back based on what it knows about devices out there. Next phase is traceroute. It contains an optimized traceroute implementation. Our next phase is script scanning. And this is where most of the scripts are run. You can execute scripts by dash dash script and then put the script that you want or the dash SC. And then the output phase, it collects all the information gathered and writes it to the screen or to a file. And then finally, the script post scanning. This phase can process the results and deliver final report and statistics. I've installed Nmap. I'm gonna come over and launch Zenmap, which is a GUI interface to Nmap. It makes it much easier to get started learning and using Nmap with this GUI interface, as you'll see. First of all, I'm gonna choose a target. I'm going to scan a 10 gigabit switch that I have on my internal network, and I want to test it for any kind of vulnerabilities or exploits, things that I want to be aware of as it's a brand new device on my home network. I've put in the IP address of my management console for that switch, and then I'm going to come over here to profiles. Profiles are pre-created, ready to use sets of parameters and scripts that I can just use by selecting a profile. That's all they are. I'm going to choose the intent scan all TCP ports. Notice it puts in all the necessary parameters and arguments that I need to do this intent scan on all TCP ports. So I don't have to do any more than just pick a profile, it puts it in the command line, and I can go ahead and run scan. Now, one thing I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change it from timing of T4 to T5, and I'll show you why I did that in a few minutes. I'll go ahead and scan, and it begins scanning that gigabit switch. Now, I could also take this right out of the command line, copy it, come over to my PowerShell or my terminal, 
and just paste it into my terminal and I can do it right from PowerShell. And so it's doing the same exact thing whether I'm in a command line environment or in this GUI interface. Very easy to go back and forth. Now the reason I chose the T5 timing is it does a very intensive scan of the device. It's my device on my home network so I can do what they call insane scanning, which means I'm just hammering this device. Be aware when you're using that kind of aggressive scan, you can bring down a box. You can bring down an external server. Make sure you understand what you're doing before you get crazy. Now, once I start a scan using Nmap, notice that none of these tabs, host, services, ports, topology, nothing has any information because it's not done. It's running right now. So right now we're just watching it run. When it gets to finish, then it will populate all these other areas. Okay, we're now done. I'm gonna come up to the top and you can walk through and see the various things that I did. First of all, it loaded 156 scripts to do this scan. And you can walk through and of course a lot of this you have to go into the documentation to understand what it is that Nmap is doing. But it doesn't prevent you from starting to use it right away. So I may not understand everything that every script is doing, but I can see right away it found HTTPS, a 443 TCP port open. It has identified certain information about this switch. I also see from the SSL certificate, I see some very interesting information about the type of certificate that it's using. I can see the MAC address. I can see that a general purpose device, it's running Linux 3.x or 4.x. It can't determine exactly but it is understanding that I'm running a Linux kernel. I can see that I'm one hop away from that device because it's on my home network. And the reason I know the script is done is because at the very bottom, it says Nmap is done. When you see that on your display, you know that this action that we've done against this 10 gigabit switch is complete. Now I can come back and I can see my host information and the little icon shows me a the Linux penguins. I can go to services. It found HTTPS. I can go to my ports. It doesn't show me any port information. It shows me topology. If I come up here to controls, actually I'm gonna go to fisheye and I'm just gonna go to this plus sign and it will open this up so it's a little bit easier to understand and read. You can see my local host and I'm directly connected to this switch. Let's go look at host details. And it really didn't display a lot of information because I didn't ask it to. Here in PowerShell, I'm still running that same script. Remember, I copied and pasted it from the GUI into PowerShell. It's still running in PowerShell. It hasn't completed running in this different interface, but it eventually will. If I want to, I can output the display into a file go back and look at that file later on. We're going to begin by looking at some very practical ways of using Nmap in your local area network as an IT professional. A lot of servers have what's known as out-of-band management or also known as lights-out management. It's a separate chip and operating system that allows you to remote into that server or firewall or router without impacting the production portion of that server you can do all kinds of incredible things with out-of-band management. Well, it's a very big source of attack. So here is my HP server's out-of-band management console. It's an HTTPS. I can access it through a single IP, and it gives me incredible insight to the hardware, to what's going on with this server, without ever impacting the 2016 server that's running on the hardware. The problem is this Linux out-of-band management system can be attacked and is attacked by hackers. Remember when we introduced the Nmap documentation, I told you one way that you can effectively and easily begin to use all this powerful scripting and parameters of Nmap is use categories. I'm going to take a look at using the brute category, 
the exploit category, the intrusive category, and the vulnerability category. This allows me to quickly utilize all these powerful scripts against my ILO interface to see is there anything that is being exposed that I was not aware of that maybe I need to shut down. If I want to look at what scripts are run under these categories, I can click exploit and all of these scripts are going to run by simply using that category name. So to begin with, I'm going to get my Zen map and I'm going to put the IP address of my ILO interface on that server. I'm going to go to profiles and I'm just going to pick one of these scans. I'm just going to pick the intensive TCP and basically it sets up some of the scripts that I want to. In fact, what I think I'll do is go to a comprehensive with scripts. I'm going to use this profile. What I'm going to do is come up here. There's a lot of parameters that will go ahead and launch certain scans. What I'm going to do is come to the area where it says scripts and I'm going to take this and I'm going to go ahead and edit this whole set of scripts except the IP address. I'm going to leave the IP address there, hit the delete key, and then I'm going to put in the categories that I want the script engine to run. So when I launch the profile, it put in a whole bunch of scripts that I didn't want. So I removed all those scripts from my command line and I added the category names, vulnerability, comma, brute, comma, intrusive, comma, exploit. And I'm going to run those categories of scripts against that one IP address. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hit scan and notice nothing shows up. I don't see anything because I didn't turn on the verbose parameter. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to cancel, come back up here and add the dash V. And now I've added the verbose so I can actually see what's going on. You don't have to see what's going on. It will eventually show up. But in this case, we want to see what's going on. So I'm going to go back and hit scan. And there we can see the pre-scanning. Here we see it's loaded 308 scripts. Here we see the pre-scanning. It's going to do a lot of these parameter scans right up here. And we're just going to sit back and watch. Now, let me stop it again. Remember the timing. T2 is very, very slow. So I'm going to remove that and put T5. Now it's going to hammer that IP address port. But that's okay. It's my device. If it bellies it up, hey, it's mine. I can do that. So I'm going to put on T5, leave the dash V, which is going to give me verbose, so I can see what's going on. And we'll come back and we'll scan again. This is going to run much faster because I'm telling it, go ahead and just throw everything you have at this port. Now back to the web page that gives me the ILO interface and you can see it's just crawling. I can really pull up nothing about the server from this operating system because I'm just hammering it with Nmap and packets. So if I try to find out ILO Federation or Location Services Discovery, you can see my little it's just saying uh, it's having a hard time. So when I click on different tabs to see information displayed, you can see it's just sitting here loading. Well, I'm hammering that port. Let's take a look at the phases as they're running. Here's the script pre-scanning phase. It also ran in this very beginning, it ran a broadcast denial of service, a script against that device. And it even gives us the CVE for that denial of service attack. The good news, I can see that we're not vulnerable with its discovery, so that's good news. Here I have my target enumeration. It's initiating the DNS resolution. Now the third phase of an Nmap is the host discovery, but notice I've got the dash PN argument up there, so it's going to skip this. The next phase is the reverse DNS resolution, and then we go to port scanning, and we can see here we go. And it's going to use the thousand port scan. It could scan all 65,000 UDP and TCP ports, but that was not selected in our arguments and switches. We can see here that it's found a number of ports 
We see SSH, port 22, port 80 open, port 443, port 17988. So there's a number of ports that are open on this ILO feature on the server. I don't see the version detection phase. It may have been skipped, but I do see the operating system detection phase. The dash O here would indicate that it were asking scripts to run and try to identify the operating system. I don't see traceroute run on this particular Nmap scan, but I do see the script scanning being run and you can see a lot of scripts are being run through here. Now the output phase obviously is working because we're getting output from this script. And then finally the script post scanning phase was done and we can see Nmap is done. One IP address, one host is up, scanned in 930 seconds, how many packets were sent, how many were received, and now we can go up and see the host. It didn't really identify the operating system. It just shows a computer monitor. If we go to services, I don't see anything here. Let's go to ports and host. I don't see anything here. Topology, this is very close to my local host. If I go to fisheye and I bump that up, host details, it does recognize that it's an HP ILO remote management interface, recognizes that. It shows me here under ports used, it shows me a variety of ports that it feels like are available. The operating system, basically it's an HP ILO version four. Back to our results. A lot of these scripts here did not run because an argument was missing. I could go back, look up that script, find out what are the arguments available in the documentation, add that to my command line and run it again. Now all the ports on this ILO interface are open and available. This one should not. So this one, port 80 should be closed. There's no reason to have port 80 when I'm using 443 or HTTPS. So I need to go in and disable port 80. So that's one valuable insight. Another is this port 17988. It is open and it is filtered. I need to find out what that is, why that's there, and can I and should I disable that port? Now the last thing I want to do is save this. I'm going to go ahead and go to my scan, save the scan, and I can, by default, it wants to save that scan in the Nmap folder, the directory that holds the tools and utilities for Nmap. I'm going to choose another location and put it where I want it to be. Now it saves the file in an XML format, so I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to give it today's date. And with that, I now have a date the type of scan that I did. And if I want to run that scan later after a firmware update, just to see changes, I can then compare the two and see what differences there are between the two. Now in this video, I have special bonus content for all my Tech Savvy channel members. And we encourage you, become a member of Tech Savvy. When you go to our channel homepage, you can just become a member by simply joining because YouTube is simply giving less and less of our ad revenue to the content creators. That's the way they do it. There's nothing I can do about it, but they do give us the option of membership, which allows you to help us produce this material. Listen, if I produce content on how to create port tenderloin, I could get 50,000 views per video and we wouldn't have this conversation about becoming a member. That would generate plenty of ads, plenty of revenue. We wouldn't even have this conversation. But the content I produce is technical. You couldn't get five of your family members to sit down and watch five minutes of my video. They'd all die behind you. So this is content for IT professionals, IT enthusiasts, people that really like this type of material. And so the viewership is going to be low. Become a member, $2.99 a month, Google takes 30% of that also, but we need your help. Become a member, support the channel. It allows us to continue to produce good technical content. And if it doesn't benefit you, then I fully understand. But if you find that these videos help you understand technical content, I encourage you to become a member.